The chilling state in which 20-year-old Rita Waeni was found having been killed is still mind-boggling and unimaginable to many. Her body which was found decapitated did not have her head at the scene of the discovery. This is the first time I've come across such an incident. I've never in my forensic life I've never come across such incidents around. Me kadi mwa Nairobi, mechokeshwa sana na majamaa kunyuria madini. Mwache kutuua manzi. Why should the the matara man kill such a young girl? For what reasons? And the Kazi. Welcome to this week's episode of Oros Digest. Now, if you've been on social media and watching news, there has been some gruesome murders that happened. On the crime scene, the prime suspect in the murder of 26-year-old starlet Wahum Wangi is now under investigation for possible serial killings both in and outside Nairobi. And then yet another murder at an Airbnb. Police in Kasarani are investigating the bizarre murder of a woman who was found killed, her body chopped up and stuffed in paper bags at an Airbnb apartment in Katroy Sambu. And uh, I was trying to go to social media and try to figure out what had happened and gather all the information. And I came about several tweets. The first one was talking about how the government should declare femicide as a national disaster. Then I came upon a second tweet, which was also talking about how days of, you know, killing of women is getting out of uh, hand. And into my mind, I was like, you know, I gotta have to dig further into uh, this. The very same week that the first murder that happened, this was from the lady called Starlet Wahoo, murdered by John uh, Matara in South B. That same, very same week, 15 people died from an accident. I think it was in Nakuru uh, for that case. And it didn't get the same outrage of people online, I want the government to consider that, you know, public transport accidents are a national uh, disaster. This remind, reminded me back of something I was reading a while back about terrorism. Generally terrorism in most countries, let's say the US or Kenya, will probably kill between 100 and perhaps 200 people in a whole year. But accidents, drugs, just normal crime, kill way more number of people. But terror creates this kind of overhanging fear. That's why it's terrorism in people's mind. So people tend to put more weight on terror, even though fewer people get killed, other than things like accidents, where almost on a daily basis people get killed on the road. Now, when thinking about that, I went into looking at the stats about uh, femicide in Kenya. And there's this graph from the Twitter account stats underscore Kenya. And it shows the number of women who are killed um, uh, every year. And before we get into that, there's the technicality of using the word femicide in this case. Now, if you go to the World Health Organization, the technical and strict definition of femicide is the intentional killing of a woman specifically because she's a woman. Now, if you stick with the strict definition for that, then you realize the only type of murders which can be considered to be femicide are actually serial killers. For example, the Yorkshire Reaper in the, in the UK back in the 1980s used to kill prostitutes because he just had this negative connotation in his mind about uh, prostitutes and he would just kill because they're women. From the mid-1970s to the early 1980s, a serial killer would torment Yorkshire, England. In his wake, he'd leave 13 women dead and have at least seven survivors. Now, if you consider intimate partner violence, which is, you know, two people in a relationship and one person ended up killing the other person, I don't think that really qualifies with the strict definition of femicide because the root cause might be someone cheated someone stole money, someone fell apart, someone abused the other person. Just like any normal human relation, men will kill other men for similar reasons uh, for that. So when I was looking about like it's femicide, I'm like, no, 
a lot of these are homicides, just one person killing the other person. Now, having said that, murder tends to create, just like terror, it tends to feel like an unwarranted death. Like this should not, shouldn't be uh, happening. But the same way, accidents are not supposed to happen. But murder creates a acrimonious feeling within people and it elicits a lot of uh, emotion. Hunger kills a lot of people in northern Kenya. Malnutrition, death through something we could call unnecessary death. Death through, let's say, during childbirth, so on and so forth. Treatable diseases. But it doesn't elicit the same emotion than when a woman gets uh, killed. Now, that doesn't mean that it's okay to kill women, no. Any death, be it a child, a man, a woman, whoever it is, should not happen in this case. But then why do some types of death carry more public awareness, if you may call it uh, so? Now, this brings me to uh, a statistical phenomenon, okay? So, Way back in 1830, uh, there was a French mathematician known as Simon Denis Poisson, or Poison, if you like to call him uh, so. He was interested in how events happen. And one of the things he was interested in is how juries decide someone is guilty or not. So you could find five people are guilty and then the next not guilty. So there was inconsistency in, in that. Out of all that study of that data about conviction, came up with something known as a, as a poisson clump or poison clump, if you prefer that uh, in English. Now, this uh, poisson clump states that when you're dealing with random events and you consider the time on a time scale, these random events, they don't occur in uniform. Meaning that if you consider murder, and murder is a random event because people don't sit down and decide on January we'll kill five people unless you're Joseph Stalin. Stalin used to give his party members list of, I mean, uh, KPIs of how many people need to be killed every month so that you could get rid of them. But normal murder is a random event. It can be spontaneous out of an argument. It could be premeditated out of wanting to take somebody out of a business deal, so on and so forth. So for this type of random events, according to uh, uh, Poisson clumps, it says that they appear in clusters. So if we consider this diagram where January there are five murders, February 2nd, five murders, so on and so forth until end uh, of the year, it means that's uniformly distributed according to statistics and, pro and probability. But actually in real sense, what happens is like in certain months, you probably have no murder. Then in other months, you have murders clustered within certain areas. So according to this particular theory, Poisson clumps, is that random events happen within clumps in, in this case. Now, coming back to the murder and femicide with a loose definition uh, for it, if we look at the chart showing number of uh, women victims every year, th there's no sharp rise. Yeah? And if you look for the past, say, 10 years data, and consider the population growth, we could say, okay, it is within that particular range that you expect it to be. But then why does it create that boom, crazy emotions within people, especially uh, in the past few days? It's because of Poisson clumps. Due to randomness, in certain months, you'll have many murders within a month. And then certain months, you'll have no murders. So those are the first within uh, this period is fast happening in South B. Then there was a gruesome, very gruesome murder in Roisambu. And then I think there's another one in Nakuru. And I think yesterday I read about another one. So about four. So in about one and a half weeks, you have four murders. So if you look at the average murder rate of a woman every month, then using this formula, the Poisson clump, it helps to calculate what's the probability that I'll have, let's say, four murders within a week uh, for that. So you take the average and the time period you're looking at, and then it gives you a probability. So you'll fi you find out that <clears throat> the probability of having four murders, and especially women, within a month is very low, but it's not improbable. If you extend the time, let's say if you observe data for 
past 10 years, it's bound to happen. And a very good example of this was in the US, in Florida. So in Florida, within a certain period, I think it was 2001, 2011, all of a sudden, there was a, a very big sharp rise in shark attacks uh, in, in the oceans. And now there's an institution within the US that actually collects data on shark attacks within uh, Florida. So one uh, researcher decided to look into this. I think his, his name is Professor David. In this particular scenario, people thought about like what's causing the increase within that period for shark attacks. There's so many theories that came through. Perhaps their habitat, food habitat has been messed up. So now they're going to look for you know, food in other areas. Maybe the currents have changed, uh, climate change, weather, something has happened that now made shark move from where they are and now attack more uh, people. But then the professor took the data for, for starting from 1957 up to about 2011, uh, I believe. And he looked at what is the average shark attacks every month. And he applied the Poisson clamp formula and he came to realize and made an explanation that possibly there's nothing causing this increase in shark attacks. This is just a, a result of random events. If you have sharks moving randomly in the ocean, swimming, at one point you'll have more sharks in a given area, not because of weather has changed or because anything has happened. It's what you call the result of random processes. I don't know whether you've ever encountered, for example, at some point, let's say certain type of celebrity die. Like when Kofi Annan died, somebody else died, David Bowie died, and like, oh, you know, someone is killing politicians. No, it's just because death is a random process. At some point, a certain type of people will die at the same time, in this case. Or like rain. Sometimes you, you have below average rain. Sometimes you have average rain. And then there's some point where you have heavy rains like we're having uh, right now. But if you look at the entire year, do you have more rain this year than last year? You realize the difference is not that uh, big. So the professor came back and said, actually, there's nothing causing the shacks. This is a result of random process. Now, humans don't like that kind of answer. That is a random process. They want a causality. Something happens. Somebody's messing up the habitat for the, for the shacks. Okay. Now, Applying that same logic back to uh, the femicide in, in, in Kenya, I believe this model applies to, to, to femicide because within this very short period, due to randomness, you have all these murders happening within a very short uh, time. And it's very easy if you look at it, you think like, okay, this is going crazy. This is getting out of hand. And what do you assign to that? Human always look for causality. It's men killing women. Men are becoming more aggressive. They're not well trained. It's about something else. There's a difference between people killing women or men killing women and people justifying it. Online, people would say like, oh, she deserved it or she's a gold digger or whatever they say. That's a very different thing and wrong to say and abhorrent in all kind of manner. Because one of the things that you like to, if you look up the full different murders that so far has happened. Actually, they're very different. The very first one committed by John Matara, he's a criminal. The plot is getting complex with more victims of John Ongoa Matara emerging to record statements with detectives four days after his arrest, claiming that they were assaulted tortured and sexually violated by the suspect who later stole their cash and left them with life-threatening injuries. So it got to around midnight. Umse akanza kunipiga. Akani umiza shingo. Yeah, he did some bad things to me. He, took, he went to my investor and checked the people who had sent me the largest amounts of money. So yeah, akashukwa chukwa details out, but he keeps calling my dad daily and threatening me. Akiambia babangu. If I'm not going to send, if he's not going to, if I'm going to go to the police, he's coming out one day. So his intent is purely criminal to gain money. Now, if you look at the example in Roy Sample, that's gruesome. That's serial killer kind of shit. Dismembered body. It's just too, it feels like this is ritualistic, right? So the motive is very different. 
if you look at the killing in Nakuru, the partner, one partner killing the other, this feels like it was disagreement within a relationship. So technically, you can put this murder as being the same type of thing. And now when you say this is femicide, they were not killed because they were women. John Matara is a criminal. The other guy is a ritualist. This other guy, disagreements within the relationship. But we cannot avoid the part where we know women get targeted because they are weaker considered to men. That's why serial killers prefer to kill women. It's easier to subdue women than men. But the ultimate reason was not because they were women, right? Now, if you take all these factors and put together and say, okay, do we have a femicide crisis in Kenya? Probably not, yeah? Because if you believe in the Bible and the story about Abel or Abel, whatever you prefer, and Cain, killing started way, way back. And it's almost impossible to eliminate killing in a society. Yeah. Iceland, which has about 400,000 people, has about two murders a year. But the more you increase that population, you will increase the number of people getting killed. Now, the only thing you have to look at is how many people get killed for every 100,000 people. Some countries are very violent, like South Africa is crazily violent against women. South Africa has among the highest stats in the world around GBB and violence against women. One in three women in South Africa will experience sexual attacks. Two in five women will be beaten by their domestic partners. Between 30 and 40% of women have experienced sexual uh, um, or physical intimate partner violence in their lifetime. It's really a society where violence has become normalized. So the society is where that hate is very directed to women and it's a known fact. I don't think we've gotten there to Kenya. It's there, we cannot say it's not there. But I like to think about this as more as homicides. Countries like Japan have managed to really reduce, amongst the developed countries in the world, Japan has managed to reduce their homicide uh, rates within the world. And that brings me to the idea of how do you reduce femicide? I think you need to reduce homicide for you to reduce femicide. Uh, the idea that you can, you can call femicide a national disaster and not call homicide a national disaster is wrong. So do you think you can eliminate femicide and then just keep men killing each other? Those factors that make men kill each other or that environment that encourages men to kill each other is the same environment or factors that propone men to kill uh, women. Now, if you go to countries like the Netherlands, you see videos, for example, the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, cycling his bicycle, going to parliament, going about his business, or other Scandinavian countries where the Prime Minister takes a train going to, uh, to, to parliament or uh, his or her business. One of the reasons why the Prime Minister could do that is because the general security has been improved, right? That will never happen in Africa. You'll have a motorcade of 20 cars passing and bodyguards and police and everyone getting on and off the road. So if you want to make your prime minister, your president, be able to walk freely and you improve the general security, that will trickle down into the ordinary person who can wake up at midnight and say, I want to take a walk into, in the park and enjoy myself without getting mugged, killed, stabbed, whatever. So you have to in improve the general security in order to improve the specific security. You need to reduce homicide in order to reduce femicide. Now, there's a, uh, Americans played around this idea about security, murder, homicide, how to reduce it. And there's one theory, which I agree with it partially, although I feel like it's incomplete. It, it's called the broken window theory. The broken window theory was studied by some psychologists in the 80s uh, in New York. And what they say that is, <clears throat> if you have one, if you have a window and you have several window panes there, if one window is broken or one pane is broken and doesn't fix, it doesn't get fixed, it encourages someone else to come next and throw a stone to that window. And over some period, all the windows will be broken. And that idea 
translates to that if you have an area where there's intolerance, yeah, people find, not intolerance, people tolerate certain things, sorry. It means that when you have small vices that are not corrected, people feel encouraged to take bigger vices. So the uh, researchers in, in, in the US decided like, what we're going to do is let's go to an area where there's high crime, let's fix the area, let's clean the street, Let's make sure the trash cans are all there. Let's fix all the window. Let's paint all the, uh, the buildings. And let's see if crime changes. So they did the experiment and all forms of crime went down. Well, that's the US. I don't think that theory applies all of it in, in Kenya because I think most crime tend to happen because of financial issues. If you go to Dandora and say, you know, compare it with Karen, Part of the reason why there's disparity in crime, mud, and everything else is just because one area has less resources than the next area, which is current. But it's worth it to do this experiment and say, if you go to an impoverished area in Nairobi, choose whichever you want, clean the place up. Will crime go down? Maybe, maybe not. Because there's another researcher who came up with another theory called the defensible space theory where he says that when people have a space and an environment where they feel they can defend it, when the environment is clean, people feel they need to defend it. The trash, the drugs, we will die from what this idiot is trying to shove down our throat. Which means when a murder happens, they'll report it because they don't want that place to degrade. But if you really live in a degraded area, that you don't feel the need to actually make the area better. Those theories are, you know, I feel like they're half theories. Like they're, they're, not, they're, in, they're not wrong, but they're incomplete. But what I like about them is this idea that if you change the general, you can fix the specific. And I think that's one of the points about these murders uh, that are happening. You have to look at why do people kill? What drives people to, 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 to kill? Once you start looking at those factors from that point, then you can solve that. But you wouldn't look at why do men kill women? You're already boxing your place into a very narrow uh, place and how would you even fix it? It's very uh, hard. When there's some movement, feminist movements and other movements that talk about, hey, let's champion this course about femicide. Let's bring this information to full. That's okay. But one of the things you, you came to notice is that most feminist movement haven't really changed much actually for women. If you go by the data, one of the things that if you consider, let's say the past 200 years, what has really emancipated women from the state they were, it's less of activism. Actually, it's innovation and technology. One of the things that uh, you find out is, start from, let's say, about the 18, late 1800s in the UK and in the US, women could not vote. Uh, they didn't have those rights. One invention that was very simple but changed everything about women was the bicycle. Now, during this time, women were mostly confined to their homes. Women rarely left their homestead or within the vicinity of their homes because they needed a man to go with them somewhere. They could not get up a horse because they needed a man to help them get a horse. If it was a carriage, they needed a man, all that. Now, when the bicycles were invented, it gave women this ability to actually go somewhere by themselves, do something by themselves. And all the suffragette movements in the US and the UK really talked about how the bicycle was a very big game changer for them. It allowed them to even go to the meetings and organize themselves, and even now put the government to task on why they can't vote while their men can vote. So the bicycle emancipated women. Now they could travel distances they couldn't travel. And that ability to travel enabled them now to socialize, discuss what they wanted and meet other women from other areas where they could champion a course that they want. Just from a simple bicycle. But the bicycle did a little bit more than that. During that time, if you look at the Victorian dresses that women used to put with a corset and the layers of dresses, it was very heavy. But when they picked up cycling, it was one of the things that it was very impractical to cycle for a considerable distance. Women said like, you know what? I can't dress like this and cycle. So the fashion and the types of clothes women started putting on had to change. And now that idea that a woman cannot show her thighs, cannot show her legs, started going away because 
if women are going, to, are going to cycle, their attire needs to change for that. So the bicycle also contributed to the change in the women's uh, attire. It was not lobbying, it was not shouting, it was a very simple piece of technology. Look at something else, like sanitary pads. Now, the origin of sanitary pads, which ironically was invented by Benjamin Franklin, was supposed to stop soldiers from bleeding in battle. So when they get shot, sanitary pads were used. But then someone came up with the idea that, you know what, uh, this idea of a disposable sanitary pad, which was, sanitary pads existed in some funny way before, but the disposable sanitary pad, the one we know as today, came from the battlefield and was implemented by women like, oh, women can actually use this uh, for their monthly cycle. And guess what that did for women? Some organizations, some people will never hire women because for three or four days in a month, they'll have to take leave. And they had no way of controlling their natural uh, processes. But now the invention of the sanitary pod allowed them to now be able to come to work and comfortably continue the work, which now made more women come into the workforce uh, for that. The examples go on on. The internet, the computer, Think about right now working from home, what is it has done to moms, right? It has enabled you to take care of your children while you're working. And even in a safe environment where there's no sexual harassment and there's no other misogyny that goes on in your face, you can do your work and take care of your family the way you like. So very few things have been achieved through the activism. It actually has been technology that has really driven the change for women for that. So if you like to end let's say femicide, probably something like cameras are so cheap that CCTV costs a hundred shilling and they're installed in every corner. Now, no man wants to do something crazy to a woman because cameras are everywhere, right? It will have been the result of a cheap camera that made that behavior subside other than stay at the levels uh, that they are. So it doesn't mean that activism is useless. It just means that if you care about the root cause of certain things, you have to look at the structure of society. What drives people's emotions? Why do people kill? You have to go back to the Bible. Why did Adam, sorry, how, why did uh, Cain kill his brother Abel? Until next week, comment, like, subscribe. Any Buddha, after Kuochiva, always subscribe. Up. Baruja subscribe. Hey, and I have more videos here.